All right, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today um, for the newest installment in Headland Center for the Arts Distance. Hey, okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today um, for the newest installment in Headland Center for the Arts Distance. Hey, hello. And I'm already on an endless loop. Um, uh, welcome. So uh, yeah, this is the first in a series of distance programs um, called the COVID Keyword Conversations. Um, today's topic is Blackness in the American Outdoors. Um, so before I describe the series and our topic for today in more detail, um, I'll just briefly introduce myself and Headland Center for the Arts for those who may not know already. Um, my name is A. Preston Mint, and I'm the program manager here at Headlands. Um, well, maybe not here. I'm currently broadcasting from my home in Oakland. Um, Headlands Center for the Arts is located in the Marin Headlands outside of Sausalito, California, across the bridge from San Francisco. And uh, it's a multidisciplinary international arts center dedicated to supporting artists. Um, and the creative process and the development of new and innovative ideas and artwork. Uh, so we've been doing that for nearly 40 years um, through providing direct support um, in the form of time, space, uh, commissions, uh, cash awards, and platforms for exhibitions and performances. Um, also that artists can create their work. Um, and we also uh, further our mission through public programs such as this one. So um, yeah, the COVID keywords conversations in particular uh, spring from a new programming initiative at Headlands called um, Thematic Residencies, um, which uh, gather both artists and non-artists. So for instance, journalists, policymakers, and scientists um, that all share expertise on a given topic, uh, such as climate change and equity or palliative care, um, you know, the list goes on. Um, and we bring these folks together in order to incubate new ideas and to foster connections across disciplines so that everyone's work can become more effective um, and more relevant for the greater public. Um, this year's thematic residency was intended to focus on Blackness and the American Outdoors. Um, through social distancing, it's been transformed into the first of these conversations. Um, which will all address the urgency of the current pandemic through different lenses. Um, the keywords conversations take their name both from a keyword project that resulted from an earlier thematic residency around climate uh, equity, um, as well as from a book uh, by Raymond Williams um, called Keywords, which is a documentation of the meaning and or transforming meanings and origins of certain words um, that are sites of contention. Um, so actually I have a copy of the book right up here. Um, so you know you can see some of those words maybe on the title um, like art, behavior, class, uh, hegemony, industry, right? These sort of like big ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, um, as the COVID-19 pandemic and its fallout um, are starting to lay bare these fundamental and systemic inequities and igniting these sites of struggle and power throughout all of our cultural and social frameworks, um, you know, we're starting to question um, the meanings of terms and institutions that have formerly been assumed as fixed or neutral or benevolent. Um, so, uh, on to the outdoors, um, you know, access to nature and the outdoors has uh, long been considered, you know, one of many personal health benefits connected to uh, environmental health. Um, so this access is a prerequisite for participation in a lot of uh, aspects of culture. So conservation, agriculture, science, natural history, um, and also the really long legacy of art and storytelling that's been inspired by the natural world. Um, so by a variety of means, including housing discrimination, um, violent policing, and environmental racism, uh, Black people and communities have always faced significant barriers to the free and equitable access to um, healthy outdoor environments in the United States. Um, 
So, uh, you know, as the pandemic continues to reveal these inequities in new ways, um, today we're going to look at how Black folks in America are facing uh, the changing relationship to public space and the concept of the outdoors uh, during COVID-19. Um, you know, we are unequally burdened by new regulations and vastly underserved by government response. Um, but in this time, we can also name and take hold of new opportunities for public joy, uh, public presence, and of course now, uh, more than ever, public protest. So, um, yeah, I guess with that, um, I will briefly list um, our panelists for today, um, and then they are going to um, introduce a little bit about their work uh, briefly before we launch into the larger conversation. Um, so uh, joining me today um, are four wonderful folks, uh, Grace Anderson, uh, co-director of PGM1, and that stands for People of the Global Majority in the Outdoors, Nature, and the Environment. Um, it's a really amazing uh, multidisciplinary summit that meets every year. Um, uh, and uh, I'm really glad to have Grace as my neighbor in Oakland. Um, also joining us is Carolyn Finney, author, storyteller, and scholar in residence at the Franklin Environmental Center at Middlebury College in Vermont. Um, really excited to have her here today. Um, when I started this project, uh, everyone I talked to was like, are you going to have Carolyn Finney on? Um, so uh, really glad to have her here today. Uh, just released a really amazing article in The Guardian. You should check it out. Um, next is Colleen Smith. Uh, interdisciplinary filmmaker, um, and just uh, uh, really glad to have Colleen here today. Just the way she uses um, the imagery of Black people in the outdoors as part of her work um, is really unique and inspirational. Um, so uh, yeah, and then finally we have Joanne Douglas, uh, who is the Watershed Interpretation Manager at Bartram's Garden in Philadelphia. Uh, really amazing, um, the first arboretum in the United States, I believe. Um, definitely go for a visit if you're anywhere near it on the East Coast. Um, and uh, she's also a member of Cosmologym, an arts and game design collective. So um, I'm going to let folks um, share a little bit about themselves um, before the big conversation. And we're going to start with uh, Grace. Hello. Um, yeah, this feels like such a sweet conversation between friends. I feel like it's the one conversation I've been really excited for since the pandemic hit and the uprising started. So really glad to be here. Um, Grace, she, her pronouns. I'm based in Oakland on Ohlone territory. Um, I describe myself, I am a community organizer and a network weaver. Um, as I mentioned, I am the co-director of PGM1. PGM1 um, is an intersectional gathering of Black, Indigenous, and people of color who work in connection with the land. Um, the space was created out of a need for Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, to have a space to gather where we didn't have to feel tokenized, be, mar be pushed to the margins, um, be asked solely to speak on diversity and inclusion panels, um, but instead have a space where we're celebrated for our brilliance, um, we see ourselves reflected and we have an opportunity to heal while working on the oppression that works between us and within us. Um, yeah, with the impacts of COVID-19, we were planning to be in Chicago this year, but have pivoted towards um, virtual programming. So we're doing affinity spaces, um, both for all Black, Indigenous and people of color. Uh, we've also been hosting Black only affinity spaces and non-Black POC spaces. Um, yeah, and some of the photos that you're seeing are from Philadelphia, where we had our summit last year. Um, and historically, the summit looks like three days of workshops, field trips, um, caucuses um, for the various identities that exist under the BIPOC umbrella. Um, and we hope to resume um, summits in the future. But I think right now what we're seeing is that we need more than a gathering in person every year. Um, I think uh as we see like more things coming online and going more regionally we're excited to expand beyond what we have traditionally done and i'll leave it there for now great thanks so much grace um next up 
we are going to um, hear from Carolyn. Unmute myself, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna share a screen as well. Uh, sorry, everyone. Not as fast as I'd like to be, but here we go. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so if, as I always have a, uh, I'm always challenged when I'm introducing myself. So the thing I tend not to talk about is what I do, but talk about more, you know, who I am and why I'm motivated and passionate about this work. Um, and I, the first uh, slide that I put up here, um, I titled it self-evident. I usually have up there the thing itself because what does it mean to talk about a thing when you are the thing itself? And if, if I may say, all of us here to some degree stand in that place. So this isn't just an intellectual conversation. But I also called it self-evident and I was really borrowing from black British photographer Ingrid Pollard who did a book called um, Postcards Home where she took pictures of black people on the British landscape portraits and just said, you know, how does that change the story of England and the land and the way we, they talk about the land over there? And for me, a lot of that is the same here too. Um, and, but here's the thing, y'all, ain't no new story. It's always been the story that's always been there, but we can talk about erasure, um, marginalization, all the ways which in which denied the story of many of our ancestors, you know, who we are and how we show up, you know, um, in this place in relation to the conversation about nature um, has been forgotten, dismissed, um, disowned, you know, choose your word. But many of us have been here to, so, uh, to bring those stories back to life or to remind us of those stories or to make ourselves heard or make others heard as well. Um, and I put those two images up there, obviously, of COVID-19 and George Floyd because like everyone else, that's sort of impacting the way I think about and engage. And I will say to you, and this may be true for everyone here, I have been, it's been overloaded, people asking for to have this conversation. The last few weeks have just seen, I, I don't know what's happening. I mean, I know what's happening, but I don't, want no, I don't know what's happening. And a lot of that is really exciting. I feel really grateful, but there's a part of me that also feels a deep seated rage. And I want to own that, you know, as somebody who works really hard to meet people where they are. I spend a lot of time in rooms with people who are predominantly white, who are working in various capacities to understand and engage. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about that rage and, you know, underneath that rage, it's hurt and loss and the remembering of every time myself and others that I know um, have been hurt and disowned and dismissed and treated badly in the outdoors in their life. And not only their life, because most of us, when we show up here, it's not just about us. It's about everyone else who's standing up here with us, those we can see and those we can't. And what does that mean to sort of bring this um, bring this into that into these kinds of conversations. And so I, that's what I spend most of my time doing. I mean, it's normally I'd be on a plane. Actually, we'd all be together, right? Doing this. So it's like this translating now is online. But most of the times it's I, I speak with people, engage with people, facilitate conversation around this, write about this, talk about this, dream about this. Um, and the last thing I was going to say, but I'm not going to because I don't want to take up the time. Many of you have heard the story about where I come from, but I always have to put up a picture of my parents and I always have to put up a picture of the land that I grew up on that wasn't theirs, wasn't ours, but they cared for it, worked on it for over 50 years um, right outside of New York City. And both my parents who adopted me and raised me and this land who adopted me and raised me you know, tell me who I am in relationship to non-human nature. Um, and all my, all the way that I feel and think about this comes from, from this, from these images that you see here. Uh, and what it meant when my parents, we all had to leave that land and what it meant when my parents could no longer return to that land and what it meant when they were erased from the history of that land by a conservation organization was not necessarily bad, but they were just able to do that because privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. 
Um, and this is the place now it has a gate we can't get in either, right? Um, and I can talk about that later. The last image I want to put up, I changed it, was from me. I spent about five years before returning to school backpacking in different parts of the world. And Nepal was one of my favorite places in the Himalayas. And the last time I was there was 2007, which is this picture. Because I think it's so important for us to also see ourselves doing these things um, all the time, always. We hold that as part of who we are because we're just as diverse and intersectional and powerful and resilient as anyone else. And we dream big. We've always dreamed big. That is how we have survived. And that is why we are here now. Now I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, cool, so next um, on the lineup, we're gonna hear from Joanne. Um, Oh, do I have to stop sharing? Oh, I, I got it. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Now, Joanne, you can start. Okay, great. Hi. Um, just to echo what everyone's been saying, especially Grace, this is such an exciting conversation to finally be having with you all. And I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, so I'll just start off that uh, my name is Joanne Douglas, she, her pronouns, and I work at Bartram's Garden um, as the watershed interpretation manager. And essentially what that means is that I inform and consult the garden on how we talk about the watershed, um, how we teach about it. And I also run all of the river youth programming that happens there. Um, our river youth programming happens in about three different parts. So one is that we boat build with middle schools in, um, we boat build with students in middle schools. Um, that's the picture that you're seeing here. Uh, we partnered with an, an organization to do this before, but we've now like gone off on our own and are doing that. And it's been really exciting. Um, we also have, um, and then those boats that are built are then housed at the Bartram's Garden community boathouse where we hold uh, public boating for anyone in the area that wants to come and just like be on the river. That's run by our high school students. There's about 15 of them that work throughout the summer. Um, during a six week full-time program, they run the public row boating. They do water testing to monitor the bacterial levels that we deal with on the um, lower tool pack Tulpehana, which is Turtle River and um, the Lenape name for the Schuylkill River. And we also, um, they spend the summer creating um, artistic visual public displays of everything that they've learned to then translate that to their, co their communities, their neighbors and their friends about what they've been doing. Um, and I will show you that. This is one example of it last year they um, created an infograph that showed the flow of wastewater um, in the area in which they live and that they boat to inform everyone about what was happening. Um, the third part of our program is we just started this with um, a grassroots organization called EDGE in Philadelphia that I'm also a co-founder of. And we created a advocacy and training group because a lot of the students were learning everything over the summer and it being like encountering all of these issues and then leaving for the winter and then coming back again. So we wanted to like connect the dots there and just have a place where they could, um, you know, deepen their understanding and explore how they wanted to go about dealing with some of the things that they were seeing. And we just don't want to let them go over those few months. Um, it's really hard to separate my work from my artistic practice. Um, and with cosmology in particular, this is one project that we worked on with Bartrams. And what you are seeing here, so a lot of the projects that I work on with them um, specifically are to do a couple of things. One is to decenter humans in science and nature. Um, another thing is to make bodies more aware of their place in a certain space and to create these 
um, social interactions where people are colliding through dance or play um, or conversation. And the one that I feel like is most important is to use games as a way to practice dismantling and rebuilding systems. So what you're seeing here is a game called Plastic Dance. And these sculptures were created by um, the founder of Cosmology and Walker Tufts. And it's a helmet inside of a box and you, there's a maze in there. And you, as you move around, a marble is flowing through the maze. And those mazes are maps of waste flow through the Tulpehana into the ocean. Um, let's see. Another, like back to dismantling systems and um, rebuilding them, um, this game that um, you'll see here is um, part of a college course that I taught with Emily Karras from the art department and Dr. Grace Sanders Johnson from uh, University of Pennsylvania. And what we were doing here was taking text from the intro of the Clean Water Act and using, um, you know, Adinkra symbols for water and other indigenous symbols and other texts about water and taking them apart and using those words to then recreate statements about water that were meaningful to us. Um, from there, we took pieces of fabric and Emily taught a, um, a workshop to dye them with indigo and then we were placing them together to create a sail and the other picture you see is um, us playing with like a, a letter press to see what those statements would look like on that fabric and that's um, you know all to like what does it feel like to take something completely apart and then rebuild it in a way that is meaningful for you and has connection to yourself or your culture um, so yeah, so I mean, I could go on and on. There's like a million projects that are happening, but this is just like a sneak peek into why I'm always canceling on people. So. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, all right, so uh, next, um, let's uh, hear a little bit from Colleen. Hi, everyone. Um, it's just been so wonderful to hear you all speak. I'm so inspired and very lucky to go last. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I grew up in California in um, a suburb, but that the house we grew up in was backed up against a, a what was called a nature preserve. It was really a, a water runoff for rainwater. So in the summer, it was swampy. And in the winter, it was covered in like vines and greenery. And um, my brother and I spent um, you know, a lot of our time, almost all of our free time back there, either like plowing through mud or picking blackberries. And I um, uh, think about that now because I'm such an urban animal who rarely actually ventures into nature and even has questions about what that means. Um, I think about that now in terms of how I interact with uh, any kind of environment and, um, and think about what it means to place uh, figures who are black in um, natural um, landscapes. The images you're looking at right now are from a piece I shot in Austin, Texas in 2006. Um, Austin is known for its watering holes, like places you go and swim um, because it's so hot. And um, um, I mean, it's like an endless, endless conversation, the conversations that um, white people in Austin like to have about their watering holes. Um, and um, I found them to be profoundly uncomfortable places. Um, and then I, I stumbled on some um, photographs by Malik Sidibe of uh, kids in Niger in the mid 60s swimming in the, in the Niger River. I'm sorry, kids swimming in the Niger River in the mid 60s. Um, um, and the way in which they inhabit that space kind of blew me away and I started to feel a nostalgia for uh, something that uh, I had never experienced, you know, um, and recreated the images with um, all of the black people that I could find in Austin, Texas, who were willing to like go to a swimming hole with me. Um, the images that you um, see here are from a film called Changing Same that I shot in 1998. Um, it was a thesis film for UCLA grad school. It's about uh, two aliens who were sent to planet Earth um, to sort of infiltrate the human the human species 
um, but they accidentally find each other, fall in love, and then die tragically, ending their own lives. Um, in the meantime, though, they're, con they're just wandering through this urban um, landscape. Um, and the, the sort of alienness of them and the alienness of the landscape is something that I was contemplating in this part of LA that I live in now and still really love the landscape. This still is from uh, um, a film called The Fullness of Time that was shot in 2006 in, uh, I'm sorry, in 2008 in New Orleans, post Katrina. Um, as you can see, that's a, that's a porch without a house um, in the lower, uh, the L9 district of New Orleans, the lower ninth ward. Um, and, um, you know, two, that was two years after the, the, um, the, the waters came and um, debris had been cleared, but very little had been built. Um, and um, I'd, I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, and I just kept taking snapshots of people standing on porches, looking out at the sort of fields that had been cut and mowed or the fields that had not been cut and mowed. Um, and spent a lot of time listening to people and their relationship with the levee and the water. And it's a really profoundly complex relationship down there with water. Um, another film, I can't stay away from New Orleans. Uh, this one was shot in, I think, 2015, um, uh, maybe 14. Um, and it's like a literal rumination on water and the underneath the subterranean, the low end frequency um, in New Orleans as it relates to history and spots and um, spots in the city where there's something about uh, the low end frequency that is palpable, real, and legible in the city. Um, and um, again, this is a site where a place used to be Glass House was there, and um, was it was a it was a nightclub and for um, you know brass bands and funk bands. Um, and um, it was not, of course, it wasn't rebuilt after the waters in 2005. Um, and when I asked this musician to show up and play at that site, he was almost angry with me because he thought that I I didn't know what had been there. And then he played beautifully when he learned that I, I did know. Uh, this film is um, recent, um, shot in 2018, um, called Sojourner. Um, and it's a, a film that attempts to connect and link um, ideas around radical hospitality and generosity and relations with one's environment and with spirit through um, three different or two different women, Rebecca Cox Jackson, who was a sh Shaker Eldress who lived in Philadelphia, uh, and uh, Alice Coltrane, who had an ashram here in, um, in, in Malibu, California. And it also um, used um, Kambahi River Collective's um, manifesto and um, Noah Porafoy's desert museum site to um, create sites that sort of reenacted ideas around um, hospitality, gener generosity, relations to land, and um, futurity, like uh, imagining what might be possible um, and what it means to use and reuse even histories, sound, uh, materials, everything, and also what it means to practice Black culture and who, who gets to do it and where. Um, so, uh, so uh, and I, I don't think I even included any of the images, did I, I have um, the COVID uh, manifesto, which is um, these post-its that I've been putting on Instagram that are uh, laments about um, being in quarantine. Um, I like the shock of it. I started posting them as I was sort of going to shock, staying at home like everybody else and realizing kind of the way that the immediate response uh, was through, um, uh, the internet like this this is what we're doing and um just trying to peel back what it means to do this in some regards i'm absolutely delighted that we're doing this instead of me having to get on a plane to go to oakland on another and on another level i would give anything to be in a room with all of you um and so i'm constantly thinking about these um tensions thanks uh, thank you colleen um i guess uh you know um I will just talk really briefly about my work. Um, you know, this is not, uh, you know, I'm just more of a facilitator. This isn't really 
about me, but just so you know where I'm coming from, um, my, my art, I'm also a visual artist. I, I'm an arts administrator and a visual artist. Uh, my work is about the life and the breadth of um, interiors that hold space for queer bodies um, and, uh, and the potential energy of those bodies that are both departed from these places and waiting to arrive in these spaces, um, waiting to be held in these spaces. So um, this work uh, abstracts the vernacular architecture that's present in gay bars and clubs. Um, it originates uh, from my work as a DJ and an organizer for a collective called Chances Dances, which originated in Chicago in 2005 and sort of stopped operating uh, around 2017, 2018. Um, but the meaning of the work has always evolved in relation to politics. Um, this body of work began the same month as the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, um, and it continues on while the future of these like really unique historic and safe spaces for queer people and intimacy and culture uh, remains completely unknown. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen to these spaces anymore. Um, I arrived at my work in arts programming and arts administration uh, through a combination of things, uh, including performance and event curation during my time as a DJ with Chances Dances, um, but also oddly enough through my background in publishing, um, which uh, I'm a, trained as a printmaker in art school. Um, and that sort of culminated recently in the founding of the Chicago Art Book Fair. Um, if you can't tell, I spent a lot of time in Chicago before coming out to the Bay Area. Um, but I also did a lot of work for rural and semi-rural artist residencies for over 10 years. Um, and this is where a lot of my um, relationship with the outdoors developed. Um, you know, I mean, kind of like Colleen, it like developed in my backyard, quote unquote, <laughs> in New York. Uh, I would often go to the Palisades um, with my father uh, and he would play baseball or maybe more accurately, he would throw a baseball at me while I tried to figure out what to do with it. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of my adult relationship to the outside has been through working um, as an arts administrator. Um, so, uh, you know, here uh, I am at, uh, I'm kind of over on the left side of the picture um, at the Acre Residency in Southwestern Wisconsin. Um, I've also done a lot of work with the Oxbow School of Art in Western Michigan um, uh, in capacities as uh, staff, visiting artists, um, you know, uh, admissions, doing a lot of DEI work for these organizations um, until coming out to join the Headlands uh, staff in 2018. Um, and uh, that's where I work now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've, you know, I've ditched the baseball, but um, I am an avid runner um, and I often run in the parks, hills and forests that surround these residency sites. Um, and as 2020 has shown us, you know, we can now add that to the ever lengthening list of outdoor activities that are unsafe for us. Um, and sort of that's, that's where I come into this conversation um, as a as a humble facilitator. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, maybe just throw um, something out real quick, um, which is um, just uh, a few keywords, I guess. You know, I'm going to try to, inch, you know, go with this theme of keywords throughout this conversation and forthcoming ones. Um, and, uh, you know, some keywords that kind of came up for me when we were planning this conversation um, were narrative, um, you know, who, who controls the narrative of the American outdoors, who is seen there, who sees themselves there. Um, this idea of access, right? Um, how is that linked to access and who is able to be outdoors freely? Um, uh, a big word that came up for me was public, both as a noun, as an adjective, right? Like who kind of constitutes um, the public that has the right to be outside. Um, and then of course, joy, which I mentioned in the, in the introduction. 
um, you know, what do we do with all of that? <laughs> and, and how does that become, become joy? Um, so maybe just to kind of start with this idea of narrative, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, you know, uh, I think there are two kind of prevailing, I don't want to get too binaristic, but there are kind of two prevailing narratives that I see a lot in terms of um, the way we think about blackness in the outdoors. Um, one is just sort of, you know, the idea of the outdoors uh, as this place of um, conquering, right, in the American psyche, you know, it kind of, you know, this idea of like the frontier, um, like the challenge of the peak, you know, and that that goes both politically, you know, from manifest destiny and just, you know, the the genocide that was required to form this country. Um, and that goes through recreationally to today, you know, where um, you see like the outdoors as a place of challenge and of conquest. Um, and in both of these instances, I see this narrative um, from a white perspective, right? And then conversely, um, you know, there's this idea, even though there's a lot of um, imagery of, of um, black rurality, right? Um, especially when framed around Southern culture. Um, nowadays, there's, and this is internalized among black folks as well, you know, there's this idea that like, we don't go outside. Uh, you know, we don't do that. <laughs> um, we're not hiking, we're not swimming. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this, this, um, uh, cultural positioning of black life as solely urban um, that happens a lot and that's heavily mediated you know um, so uh, maybe I'll just leave all of that there for you all to pick apart and kind of like choose the juicy bits um, in terms of this this narrative of who who gets to be outside I mean, I'm happy to state the obvious, which is that um, I think it's really important for organizations, nature centers, parks to remember that specifically talking about black people, like we've been outdoors, like this is not, um, it, it doesn't need to be introduced to the black community on how to interact with nature. It doesn't need to be, um, you don't have to show how to use a boat or be near water or be near plants or anything like that. And I think that um, a lot of the programming that I see in the education that I see is these entities and institutions thinking that somehow it needs to be introduced to the black community. And, um, and one of the books that I recommended, uh, Undercurrents of Power by Dawson, he talks about um, canoes in West Africa and um, how the like certain villager families would have a canoe and it would be designed to represent that family and it was it's huge for commerce and travel like all of Africa is not a savanna it's rivers and lakes and marshland and how when European boats came they could not those types of ships could not get to the shore so that the only way they were able to do commerce is if those boats um, built by African people went to their ships and brought that those goods back or brought those people back and forth. So yeah, I'll, it's nice to not have to say everything because you all are here. So I'm just gonna. Um, I'd like to follow up on, on what you said, Joanne. Um, again, I, in, we've always been here. It's not like we have to be taught anything, which doesn't mean there isn't things for us to learn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to go back, you know, to something A, you said about uh, nature and the outdoors as something to conquer. So for me, part of the initial challenge that we all have in this country is that, except for the indigenous folks, is the, we've separated ourselves from nature. So we, we, the fact that we think of nature as something outside of ourselves, for me, is our first problem. Right. So we're trying to get whole with nature when really what we need to do is get whole with ourselves. And I think part of the challenge for black people broadly defined in this country is that we have never been allowed, you know, or given spaciousness to really be whole. Right. And I'm not saying that's something anybody can give us, but if we understand slavery, segregation, redlining, all the 
George Floyd. If we understand anything about what it means to have black skin in this country, we have been limited in terms of how much we can breathe, right, and be whole in ourselves. So for me, it's no wonder that it can be confusing that even we buy the hype that black people don't. And it gets further complicated when as a people, we've wanted to define who we are on our own terms. We have been trying to do that actively, especially in the 60s, when we were saying black is beautiful, um, black power, all those ways that we want to call ourselves what we want to call ourselves. And at the same time, but we're asking the question, you know, but if we study French cinema, does that make us black enough, right? And I didn't say that. This was two black psychiatrists who said it in the 60s. We, we actually, I, th I, you know, in my greatest compassion for who we try to be, I think I understand why we want to, we want to kind of own things for ourselves. And at the same time, we can also limit ourselves, right? In saying that, well, what does it mean? Are you really black? What does it mean to be really black? Do black people camp? You know, do black people hike? You know, and just fill in the blanks. So I think that, you know, my, my compassion is for the struggle to, how do, you, how do you figure out who you are when for 400 years, right, white supremacy has tried to tell you you are something else? And for me, it doesn't matter if it's in relationship to an outside nature or not. We've always been getting that same message, right? So how do we, how do we deal with that, heal from that, to be who we've always been? Yeah, I, I mean, I so appreciate that. And I mean, but I, lately I've been thinking a lot about the migrations from our agrarian lives um, at the end of the um, 19th and beginning of the 20th century into urban spaces. And then again in the 20s and 30s, and then again in the 50s and post-war. That like uh, people who had to like, as Sylvia Winter says, transplant themselves onto this continent through the land itself, right? Um, then have to transplant themselves again into these cement environments um, and, and have to sort of accept this estrangement from nature. You go from eating dirt to uh, having to like fend it off in whatever tenement you're living in, um, you know? And I, I think about that a lot too, in terms of a, in terms of a, a kind of um, um, estrangement that is real. You know what I mean? So it's not necessarily just a stereotype. You know, I was also just, just thinking about um, poetic justice and the scene where Tupac takes Janet Jackson to the beach. And that neighborhood is two miles from the coastline. Um, and it's not uncommon to meet people who have never gone simply because of mobility issues, because of redlining, because of transportation. And so these things are not just like, oh, black people don't think that they can't go to nature. These things are actual real structural um, um, boundaries and limitations that um, you, you may or may not be able to navigate, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll add to follow up on what um, Carolyn was saying about like us not seeing each other. And I think that's why I've been so involved in affinity spaces. I think there's so much power when we see each other and we see ourselves reflected and celebrated for like who we are. I think uh, one of the strongest tools of white supremacy is isolation and dehumanization. And it's like, you don't do that. And we're gonna make sure you feel siloed in the work that you do and the spaces that you occupy. Um, and I think PGM1 and like other affinity spaces for like the greater BIPOC community and the black community is like confronting that head on. It's like, we're here, we've been here and we're gonna tell our stories about being here. And um, yeah, and I also think like working at the intersections, um, which is something I come from a really traditional like white led environmental organizing background um, up until recently. And something that I've noticed is like, we're not having conversations around how I can't leave the house. Like we're getting murdered in our home. So if we can't have that conversation, I can't talk about access in the outdoors. Like it's just, it's like a non-starter for me. And so something that PGM1 does is like really talk about the intersections of like who we are and like why that is impacting the spaces that we're in. Um, and so, yeah, I think recently, like why this conversation is so nourishing and why I'm so excited to see you all is just we're in a different starting place. Like we know the fears, like especially as like black femmes, like we know the fears that we face, like just leaving our homes and feeling safe. Um, and that's, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, like how affinity spaces can combat that.
Oh my goodness. I want to thank you for bringing that up because I was literally thinking about that just as I was setting up for Zoom about how um, I currently live, I live in the wrong neighborhood in LA. I live in a really anti-Black neighborhood and I won't say what neighborhood it is, but it's unfortunate because it's not a white neighborhood, but it's very anti-Black. And, and I've uh, given up on uh, taking walks, going to pick up takeout, going to the grocery store, because there's a good chance I will be verbally assaulted by somebody um, in this community. So I, even doing something like in the midst of COVID, putting on a mask and taking a walk, because I live in the wrong neighborhood, I can't do that. And I was just thinking about it because I like walking is something that I, I need to do for my work. It's how I figure out what, what to see, you know what I mean? And I'm literally, I was like, oh, wow, we really, this is real, we have to move because I can't do that here. Yeah, Grace, I was gonna say also like you mentioning affinity spaces and then, um, you know, you sharing your experience calling is super important because as someone who works with youth, um, it adds a layer onto the, the work I do. Like I can't just be an educator and I can't just be someone who like, take, you know, does youth development. I also am constantly looking out for their safety. Like am I introducing them to a practice in nature that will then get them, like possibly put them in harm? Like, especially with what happened in Central Park. I'm like, oh, I always encourage birding or walking around or things like that. Um, and I, I encourage outspokenness. So what happens if, you know, am I building more um, or like supporting youth to then become people who are then going to be accosted in nature just for being themselves? And um, even one of my students was like the other day, he was like, why is my skin color a threat? And I'm like, ugh. So it's like just holding them in those spaces is really tough. Um, and I think that we, um, with park spaces in particular, there's a lot that like in Philadelphia, they've introduced this thing called the mosquito that they want to try out, which is after 10 p.m. it emits a noise in public parks and anyone under 25 can't handle that noise. So then they are not, they are not in that park. So it's like, um, there's also like all types of signage that wants to go up and I don't think folks realize these are like subtle ways of policing black and brown bodies specifically. And it's no wonder we're seeing like um, colonial structures come down because the outside is telling us like these relics are saying, this is not the space for you. Even Bartram's had a, a design they're trying to make for a new building. And the designers came in with like English garden this and Spanish steps that, and we already have visual legacies of colonialism at the garden. Why does it have to continue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I love maybe um, a good segue from that is, is maybe this sort of uh, concept of access, right? Um, and uh, there's like an image that, that has been popping up in my mind today, like as I was preparing for this event, um, you know, that that's uh, from right before sort of the uprisings, um, there were images coming from New York uh, where on the same day, you know, you would see police handing out uh, free surgical masks um, to mostly white folks. Um, the pictures I saw um, were, I, um, were from Hudson River Park, um, which is incidentally um, a redevelopment of, uh, you know, a POC queer and trans hangout, <laughs> um, you know, in the 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, you saw folks not social distancing, you know, police come through all right, let's help you out, give you these free masks. On the same day, you see images of um, uh, brown folks in their neighborhoods being violently arrested, um, uh, detained, cited. Uh, there's one clip of like a woman with a child in the subway, you know, they like separate the woman and the child. She actually had, I think maybe had a mask on, but it was like on her chin and she was on the phone, you know, like stuff like that, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this is even before um, uh, 
George Floyd, um, you know, was on the news and um, the, the question of sort of like, you know, what does a non-policed <laughs> neighborhood look like, right? And the answer is in those, um, those photos, right? Like, you know, those, the, the police at Hudson River Park where we're not really policing, right? They were, they were performing a social service, right? And so like, we already actually know what a non-policed neighborhood looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about if, uh, if the narrative is sort of that, that the outdoors is a, a white domain, right? Then inherently the presence of brown and black bodies uh, is a threat, right, to that domain. Um, and so, yeah, if maybe people want to expand even more a little bit about how um, the limiting of our access to these spaces has been a key part of maintaining these uh, structures of wealth and power that are linked to the land. Um. Oh man, it's something I said in the Guardian article, which is, you know, that systemic racism doesn't stop at the park gates. One of my, you know, sort of frustrations with um, the mainstream environmental movement and, and a lot of the organizations is that historically, it's as though that conversation about the environment is had separately from all the conversations about systemic racism that really happen to some degree in every other sector. And I think what was really interesting when what happened with Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper the same week that, you know, when George Floyd was killed, that there was an, an opportunity yet again to say, you know, look, these things are not unconnected, right? You know, there's a continuum where you have the experience of someone like Christian Cooper, and perhaps many of us here, I know I've had those experiences where you get challenged, you get stopped, you get stared at, whatever that experience is, that insecurity of not knowing what's going to happen, all the way to the possibility of death, right, can happen in a park, can happen on the beach, can happen in the woods just like it can happen on a city street. I was, um, a few days ago, there was an article, and all I remember is her first name, which happens to be Brianna. But the article was about a 15-year-old black girl in a um, wealthy neighborhood in Wellington, Florida. And her, she lives there with her grandfather. It's a predominantly white, wealthy neighborhood. And she was walking with two white friends down the street. So she's 15 years old. And there's a video of a grown white man yelling at her saying, you don't belong here, right? What are you doing here? You don't belong here. And I flashed back to when I was nine and got stopped by the cops in the neighborhood where I grew up. It just, I said, this, this same thing is still happening. And those police men and women who are on the job are, are, are people who come from these communities, right? So we can challenge and defund the police and I'm all for it actually, but it can't stop there because that's not what, they weren't born into that job. They were born into their communities. They've been educated in a very particular way to look at us, think about us, think about those spaces and whether they realize it or not. I mean, I look at somebody like Amy Cooper. I actually, Amy Cooper could be a nice person, you know? You know, I bet you Amy Cooper didn't walk into that park going, what I'm gonna do when I see a black man. But the thing is, privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. And that's the first thing that came up. She didn't say, I'm going to call the police because I feel threatened by this person or this man. What she said was an African-American man. She weaponized that. And there's something about how that is embedded in the consciousness of this, of this country, right? That you can go to that just like that. And, for, and so for me, it's how do we bring, how do we carve that out and address that and heal that? so we can move forward. You know, I, I actually think this is where the advocacy of all, all manner of like sports and athletics is so crucial. And I'm sure, Grace, you have a lot to say about this because I feel like, I, you know, I, I love to ride my bicycle um, on Instagram. I follow just peculiar jocks, right? So there's this woman and her handle is Brown Girls Climb. And I, did you see the video of her weeping because she takes little girls, little brown girls out to learn how to rock climb. And while these little girls were rock climbing, they were verbally assaulted by other white climbers. 
um, who were suggesting somehow that they didn't belong there. And her job is to bring these girls out and onto this rock and get them to climb it and know that they can do this. And she has to do this surrounded by other climbers who have uh, clearly very high opinions of themselves, who feel like a, a certain kind of ownership over that that's fully weaponized through race. Um, and she was like, I don't know how to keep them safe, which is something you were saying as well, Joanne. And, um, and, and I, but I do feel like, like she posted this amazing kind of intervention on Instagram Live and I felt like I could feel uh, people hearing her, you know what I mean? And I feel like the advocacy of like cycling groups and climbing groups and I don't know, surfers, et cetera, uh, them starting to look at themselves uh, is, a, is a way, um, is, is like the way that we can be helpful in terms of helping them see themselves. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense i yeah i i know we're running low on time but i will say like the exhaustion that i'm feeling as a black woman and i'm sure you're feeling also um as other women on this call is like we've been telling you all <laughs> that this is happening to us and like the fact that murder and like, we need to lay bare. I remember I cried at a staff meeting at a well-known environmental organization um, who like, was like, we keep having turnover of black women here. We don't know why. <laughs> and it's like, we have to lay our pain bare for you to understand and to see us. And my hope is that that is, this is the stopping point for that. Cause I'm tired. I'm like so exhausted, like explaining to people and like recounting these horrific racist experiences that I've had in the outdoors. And so my hope is from like here, like, just believe us, like believe black people when we say this is a racist country and then start doing something about it. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you so much, Grace. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that's sort of um, crystallizing a lot for me is like the, the way in all of these arenas, I guess, that are so fraught for black folks are are this, these just sort of really like intensely overlapping um, concepts that, uh, um, you know, like the pu like public, right? Um, outdoors, <laughs> right? Nature, right? All of these things, um, you know, they, they mean similar things, but, um, you know, um, uh, have a lot of different histories and connotations. Um, but, you know, the, the Black experience of those things is, is fraught with all of these power struggles, right? Um, and I think about the way in which, like, you know, to name something is to sort of have power over it, right? And, and the, the difficulty that we have in sort of um, naming ourselves and naming these things is, um, you know, like Carolyn, you were talking about, like, how do you talk about the thing when you are the thing and you're in the thing? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I want to say, I, I want to say, because I'm sorry, I couldn't, I was like chomping at the bit here, <laughs> making me chomp at the bit, which is when I was writing Black Faces, White Spaces, I interviewed a lot of Black people around the country. And one of the, and I would ask, if I say environment, what does that mean to you? If I say park, what does that mean to you? If I say nature, because I wanted to hear what you're just saying, like, what is your, how do you think about it? What is your experience of it? And one of the things I heard over and over again was, nobody's ever asked me that before, or mm. I don't have a story. Mm. And I said, well, you know, of course you do. Let's help you get to it. And what really moved me is like when you said about people being able to name it, but also given the space to name it, like even to think they, and then they would tell me these incredible stories from their family, their own experience. And the stories weren't always of pain. They were often of joy, right? And that's the other piece here is that we, like everybody else, we're complicated and complex and we can hold that pain and still have a damn good laugh, right? We've had to, to survive, right? And so there's something about the beauty of that and letting black people, not letting, <laughs> making space for using the resources to 
allow, no, not allow, I can't find the right word. Black people, we can tell our own stories. We know how to do it. We've got the skills to do it. You know, you all know where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to say, like, you don't, no one has to allow us to do it. Um, and, right, the way that the, all the systems are in place in terms of what gets told, what gets made into movies, what gets written into a book, what's on a television show, what gets promoted is in part, you know, cover, it, 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 I want to use it, not a fancy word, I want to say it kind of keeps us in the shade when actually we've always been in the sun. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to stop talking. Oh, no, that's amazing. Yeah, and I think, I, think, I think that's the thing. It's like we're talking about naming, and I think maybe we're not talking about permission, but empowerment or something, right? You know, um, and uh, yeah, like, um, I think that's the thing where, you know, this, we've got this, you know, dominant narrative that the, the ownership is not in our hands. Um, and uh, even when it's not being physically forced on us by say a police officer or a random stranger who's telling you this is not yours, you can't be here. It's internalized even when it's right in front of us and we've already, we've always been there, right? Like we, you know, like just like you're saying with your anecdotes where, you know, the stories were there, they just needed to be, to be brought out. Um, and so maybe that's, uh, since we are coming up short on time, I gave us until like 2.30-ish Pacific, um, but I do want to leave a little room for kind of like, uh, maybe we can pull a couple questions. Um, and, uh, uh, but before we do that, um, I did want to go to that last keyword of, of joy. Um, and, uh, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't have to be like, um, super deep even, but, you know, just like what's, what's bringing us, us joy right now. Um, you know, what's being elevated or brought out or like, what is emerging from our work, um, in this time where, um, you know, our relationship to the outside is, you know, on the one hand more contested than ever, but there are so many windows for possibility and, and just new ideas and new thinking. Um, like what's coming up for everyone? I, I can share a little story about something I'm trying to do at my job. I uh, teach at an academic institution and right now we're in the process of trying to change the name of our Thanksgiving break to something else, pretty much anything else, but also change the orientation of Thanksgiving break so that it's no longer about um, this pressure to travel and vacate, but that it's much more about staying put, staying close and acknowledging the land that we're on. Um, and the process of, of talking through this with my colleagues and with the students has just been uh, you know, like institutional change is tedious, um, and, but it's amazing to watch it happen and, and to help people understand what change is, that it isn't something being taken away, that it's something being opened up. It, it's um, that no violence is being done to them, but in this change, we are ceasing to do violence to about a third of our student body. And it's just given me a lot of pleasure to like anticipate like this happening, that our school could just have no more Thanksgiving, like something else instead. We don't have a name yet, which is hilarious, but um, it's just something else instead. Two days off for sure, but no, no uh, pilgrims and, and, you know, kids in paper bags pretending to be Indians, you know, none of that. <laughs> Um, something that's been giving me joy and also depleting me a little bit, but I'll focus on the joy side, is the visibility of Black people right now. I, um, I like on social media, there's Black people everywhere, like on every platform I'm on. Like when I'm walking in the streets in Oakland, I just like the melanin, like the Black melanin right now is just like really highlighted and visible. And I think that's also what's depleting me because people are like coming after us for like resources and knowledge. But um with that, like, I'm just, like, finding new designers. I'm, like, got these earrings from a Black designer in Oakland, and I, like, am in love with Black people. And I think, yeah, this moment where we're, like, at home for the most part um, and able to see that and able to celebrate that, I'm, like, oh, is that how white people feel on a regular basis? Like, this, like, reflection of self in every space that they're in. 
Um, and so it's, hope, it's something I, I want to hold on to and something I've been really celebrating, just like black people. I just want to second that, um, Grace, everything you said there, because I uh, also am exhausted. And it's just feeling like uh, the opportunities for uh, that we are creating, but also being asked to do. I mean, I have to say, I just had something I wrote about Black people in the health areas translated into French. I was like, that, that's never happened before. Like, there are people far afield that I wouldn't have thought want to know, you know, are saying they want to know these stories, they want to have the voice. I mean, so the conversations, the potential is overwhelming. Um, and I feel some deep responsive, I feel great joy about it. Like you, I feel in the great joy and I'm deeply exhausted and I feel real responsibility. You know, like, man, I better come correct. I got to come correct. What does that mean? Which, and I'm a human being, which means I'm going to make mistakes, you know? So, you know, trying to find my way at this moment that we're collectively creating um, from home, no less. Like what? How is this happening right now? But it's happening. So, yeah. Um, I'll say the one thing, because I've been um, in like having little fits of rage because all of a sudden things that I've been <laughs> yelling about for years are now everyone wants to listen. And I'm like, well, what about those three years I just told you that? But anyways, um, I think for me, it's I'm finding tremendous hope and grounding in the youth that I work with. Um, they are like not having it. <laughs> they're not, they're not with this. They are, um, they don't want to talk about it. They want change now. Um, even like I used to nanny for several families and um, some of those babies are now teenagers and they're like, Joe, I didn't know. They never taught me this in school. I want to know more that like they're light years ahead of even like my understanding of blackness at that age. So, um, and being, you know, people of color, but not on blacks. And I just, yeah. So I just keep coming back to them and, you know, thinking on them and draining <laughs> energy from them. Um, to keep keep doing this um, and also just you know I had like a 10-year plan to, to have a space for black and brown youth but that's now becoming like a two-year plan because I just I don't see why we need to hold off anymore <laughs> like we need places to be safe and with one another I do I how do you guys deal with that sort of uh, rage slash res resentment I mean I'm really struggling with it like um this is the sixth summer of televised recorded murders of black people. And I'm, and it took us an eight minute snuff film um, for white people to suddenly um, decide to perform concern. Cause I'm, I'm actually not convinced that it's real. Um, and I, and I, and, uh, and uh, the, I'm not sure what will convince me <laughs> at this point. Um, what, so it's like a twofold, like, I just don't know. I, I, I am not exhausted because I say no all the time. I'm saying no. I get a lot of joy out of saying no. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but so that's one tactic, but what are you guys doing about that? Like profound resentment when someone you've known for five years is suddenly like, oh, it's so exhausting. I'm having to explain to my white friends about my other white friends, because they're white, about racism. And they just ask me all the time and I'm so tired. And just, just hearing that, I just, I'm like, I, uh, my, my fist wants to go through this wall. I don't, I know I can't, I know I can't do that. So what do I do? I'm just like choking on this frustration. What do you guys do about it? I'm curious. So, you know, when I, we started off our introductions and I brought the rage thing up and I thought, you know, I had worked on my rage. My rage was in the past. <laughs> and it came up through something very present about someone, uh, some white person who threw me under a bus six years ago about my work and then suddenly emailed me out of the blue. Uh, and it was owning mine, sharing my work and just no apology, just wanted to appropriate and make sure they're on the right side. And I was telling two friends, one black woman, one white woman, I was sitting, we're sitting there and I thought I was just telling them what happened. And I went 
into a rage. Like I was crying, like the rage, like I, I, I don't know, like, you know, I told somebody the other day, my angry Luther came out. I just, I lost it. And then I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, I didn't even know that was there because it, I, was, I was so deeply hurt. So one of the things for me is one, finding those people I trust, and I trusted both of them because they said it's important that we witness it. They didn't have to solve anything, but it, there was a place for me to put it so that I wasn't holding it in. The other thing is for me is creatively, like I feel really privileged and I'm really grateful that the work I do for a living allows me to be creative. Right. So I'm just like, do I have to write about it? I'm going to give a talk and here's how I'm going to work that in because I'm going to talk about this. Or um, if I'm facilitating whatever, I find a way to, to, to authentically bring that in. And I still have some hesitancy because, you know, there's that stereotype of black people, black women and anger and rage. And part of me doesn't care. But part of me, I realize I've been that's been I've been told that thing my whole life. You know, and I have to be a certain way. And so I struggle with that. But for me, I've just decided it's going to be part of the creative thing that comes with it. And that I trust myself because ultimately I want us to be better human beings. And I don't have to oppress you just because you've oppressed me. So my anger does not equate with hate. What my anger is, is about deep hurt and loss right? And if you can hold that, then we can have a relationship and I'm going to get excited about what we can do in the future. So that's kind of how I'm coming at it. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. Um, I, I maybe wanted to say a little bit of something where, uh, yeah, I think, uh, so say just thinking about my own work, a lot of my work is about being that, that simultaneous moment of, or not moment, but state of invisibility and hyper visibility right um you know and because because a lot of my even though my work is abstract it's about uh, spaces where identity is performed and held right um and and this is just now that we're experiencing that to the nth degree right it's on 10 it's on 11 <laughs> that feeling um and uh you know i'm trying to tap into my radical vulnerability and like just roll with it because like as as exhausting and enraging as that is like oh like oh just now oh now you want to talk about it's like well all right now <laughs> okay um you know it's like a, a a lot of times this year i've been making that analogy to like you know when when a genie grants you your wish but it's like not quite right the way you thought it was gonna be <laughs> you know like oh we're talking about abolition but i didn't think this was the way we were gonna be talking about abolition right um and so i'm trying i'm just trying to take joy in that and just you know and um and uh uh you know i think um and also um i mean i've never been a person that has sort of like held back like Colleen you were saying it's like oh you know like I love saying no I love speaking my mind like whatever you know like it's no less right now but I think to be validated in that is what is really great about what's happening now um there was a vigil in my neighborhood um a couple weeks ago and um I live in North Oakland you know it's it's historically been a black neighborhood not so much anymore um, and there was a woman who had been in the neighborhood her whole life, uh, she, you know, and was talking about how she's been increasing, as the neighborhood got better, right, she's been increasingly afraid of being outside. Um, and she brought her son up in front of everyone and was like, I want all of you to take responsibility for this child. And like the, 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 the fact that she chose those words, not like see him as a person or like, you know, don't call the cops or like treat him well, but like take responsibility, right? Um, was such a key phrase for me. And um, one thing I feel validated and joyful about now is like asking that of other people for myself and offering that for other people too. Like, let's be responsible for one another, um, you know? And uh, just like being, um, you know, just wearing that visibility um, as fraught as it is, 
you know, and as much as it gets on my nerves sometimes, <laughs> um, you know, just like being able to wear that in a different way um, feels good. Um, so yeah, um, we don't have too many um, like uh, specific questions in the Q and A. Um, there is one question, like like in terms of expanding the conversation. There is one detailed question about um, the photographer that you mentioned, Carolyn. Do you mind just like briefly just saying who that is again? Yes, because it's holding up my computer actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's In Ingrid Pollard. She's a black British photographer. And this book is called Postcards Home, where she has a lot of phenomenal pictures. I'll show you one of black people, black people in the outdoors, black people on the landscape. Um, Right, so you'll see like this. Yeah. And you know, when we you know, talk about a country in a, with a deep colonial history, right? And, and you think about the British landscape, she really challenges ideas. Um, Colleen, it made me think of you, right? You know, I was like, you know, there's, very, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of symmetry there, a lot of resonance, but it, she's great. Her work is great. Yeah. Um, oh, and then actually we do have one question that uh, piggybacks on that actually. Um, uh, it is um, asking if there are any other folks who have an artist collective or project that you're inspired or excited about um, that you'd like the audience to know about in regards to, to today's topic. I'll mention a space here in Oakland. Um, it's called the Black Thought Project. And I think there are in other spaces I've, um, just seen it in Oakland and it's downtown Oakland and it's just a wall with like three questions. I think it's like, what's making you, like what's bringing you joy as a black person? Like, what do you want people to know? Um, and then one other question that I'm blanking on, but it's been very sweet and it's only for black people to respond to. And I think people have been honoring that, um, but it's been very sweet to like pass, uh, like ride my bike downtown Oakland and see it like filling up and like constantly evolving. Um, it's just like a space for black people to like, express themselves in a very public way. I want to add for everybody to look on the website Free Black Dirt. Free Black Dirt. So Erin Sharkey uh, um, started that website and it's really awesome. It's, it's, it, looks at, it, it looks at these issues from a really artistic perspective and a Black perspective. But she's doing a book that's called A Darker Wilderness. And there's going to be 12 essays, all from Black people writing about nature using um, memory objects, you know, maybe an image of a black person camping in upstate New York back in the 40s. We're going to be taking these images and then writing what comes up to it. So free black dirt. I'm excited about it. Anyone else want to do a quick shout out? <laughs> Uh, actually, I do have one. Um, uh, I think one thing I left out in my sort of intro was uh, um, I'm really into gardening. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, moving to Oakland has been amazing for that. It's like you just like things just like pop out of the It's like, you know, things just pop out of the ground here. Um, but uh, I've been interested in um, black farmers. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is a whole other rabbit hole we can go down for another hour and a half, two hours, but, you know, the connection um, to uh, land ownership and cultivation, um, you know, that was um, any number of verbs, denied, uh, disrupted, um, broken, um, you know, scattered, <laughs> right? Like um, our connection to um, stewardship of the land and then building communities and economies and self-sufficiency from working with the land, right? Um, that's something that has been um, either uh, denied access to us or, or taken away when we were able to, 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 to grasp it for a second. Um, and I'm really excited about um, Black Earth Farms here in the East Bay. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, Soul Fire Farms, I think, in upstate New York. Um, I can't remember. Um, oh, Leah Pennyman is uh, kind of 
um, is one of the folks that runs that farm um, and wrote a book called Farming While Black. Um, and uh, yeah, just like look all of that stuff up. There's an association of black farmers, I think that is uh, headquartered in Virginia, I forget where. Um, but yeah, um, I definitely encourage everyone to kind of um, think about that, um, especially as like, you know, in the pandemic, we are keep, we keep talking about the economy and what, like what that is, what makes an economy, who does the economy really serve, right? When we talk about um, restarting the economy and um, I think our access to, to production and agriculture and self-sufficiency is so much a part of that. Um, that's not talked about. Um, yeah. um, I didn't want to, because I knew that I would have like a list of people to yeah. write about, but <laughs> just really quickly, um, Sankofa Community Farm, that's also part of Bartram's, has been doing mm -hmm. tremendous work, and it's led by a farmer, Chris, who is um, really into like um, healing the land and the soil and teaching young people about African traditions with farming and feeding people during COVID and it's just been really amazing to watch. And also um, I gave this as like part of like the resource list, but um, Soil Generation um, has been doing tremendous work throughout Philadelphia um, around black people and land sovereignty. And it is black led, it is black run, it is, it's just a, a really amazing organization. And they have started um, even partnering with other um, groups in the area like Viet Lead and which is a Vietnamese um, um, affinity group and just like really like transforming um, urban agriculture here in Philly which has mainly been very very white um, so yeah so look them up too yeah wonderful um, all right we're kind of coming up on like five-ish minutes um, so uh, maybe uh, I guess let's start wrapping up if that's okay with everyone um, I'm just gonna kind of uh, give folks some uh, follow-up information um, so you all can uh, follow our work and take this conversation further. Um, those of you that have registered um, will get a follow-up email um, with links um, and uh, the, this will be recorded um, and accessible in the future if you want to share it out with folks. Um, so uh, yeah, as we conclude, um, I'll just kind of review um, our participants for today. Um, Grace Anderson, uh, co-director of PGM1. Um, catch the, um, that website, um, pgm1.org. Um, on Instagram as at pgm1summit. Uh, you can find Grace at, at amazemegrace with underscores. Um, Joanne, um, Joanne Douglas, uh, Watershed Interpretation Manager at Bartram's Garden and member of Cosmologen. Um, again, bartramsgarden.org and at Bartram's Garden. Uh, the same for Cosmologen, cosmologen.com and at Cosmologen on Instagram. Um, Carolyn Finney, uh, author and storyteller, uh, carolynfinney.com. And uh, you can get a copy of that book, Black Pieces, White Spaces. <laughs> Um, and uh, Colleen Smith, um, interdisciplinary filmmaker. Uh, check the website, colleensmith.com, and at Colleen underscore Smith, C A U L E E N, um, on Instagram. Uh, and then, um, of course, visit the Headlands website, headlands.org, um, at Headlands Art. My own website is aay.pm. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I just want to kind of go through a, a little bit more about the context of this. We're in the middle of our annual ben benefit auction and fundraiser. Um, you know, so all of our public programming um, is sort of like uh, meant to boost um, this fundraiser. Uh, obviously, because we can't all be together right now, um, none of those events can be in person, so we're moving things online. Um, the fundraiser and auction is up through July 21st. You can look at it at donate.headlands.org slash fundraiser2020. Um, the fundraiser is going to be on throughout this whole time. Uh, some of you donated to participate today, so thank you very much. Um, 
but the auction itself um, will kick off in an online format July 9th at 6 p.m. And this year, 10% uh, of all of our proceeds will benefit the Transgender, Gender Variant, and Intersex Justice Project, project as well as the Anti-Police Terror Project. Um, and uh, we have a lot more engagements uh, this summer um, that are in connection with the fundraiser. Um, more conversations and live performances, July 7th, Town Wen and Amanda Petrusich in conversation with the live performance element from Tao. Um, we'll see some sound and video from Sam Green and JD Sampson on July 16th. Um, and we're doing some virtual studio visits on Instagram Live. Uh, we had one yesterday with Rodney Ewing. We'll also be visiting with Patty Chang, Andrea Chung, and Erica Demon in the weeks to come. So um, please do join us for that. Um, and then coming up in this keyword series, uh, the next topics, uh, in August, we're going to be talking about the idea of recovery and reopening, which we touched on a lot today, but we're going to kind of go deep then. Um, you know, who benefits from these conversations and from these policies? Um, what is the impact of them and what is the meaning of them for workers, economies, and public health at large? And in September, we'll be talking about uh, communities of care, um, primarily focusing on lessons from HIV activism, and the LGBTQ movement, um, you know, who have, you know, we've always been well versed in navigating um, intimacy, closeness, and community um, in times like this. So um, I hope you will join us for those conversations as well. Um, so I guess I'll just uh, um, exit. Uh, screen share for just a second so you can see uh, everyone's faces um, and uh, just thank you so much to um, everyone who participated today I'm really grateful for your presence and your and your words <laughs> well <Thank> all right <laughs> well um, oh, yeah um, Hope you can uh, hope we can see each other soon um, for real. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.